So I think I'll start by just telling you a little bit about my history with this place. Another artist and I took actually four floors in this building. Um, I have two floors. My wife and I have this floor and the floor below. This building was built in the post-Civil War, the late 1860s. And when we came into this building, only the second floor had electricity, water. Everything else had to be brought up. There was nothing, nothing above the second floor. All the floors were open. There wasn't any hallway. It was just a, you know open stairwell. It was kind of what they call a fixer-upper, needless to say. So, you know, the studio, for me, it's been a fantastic studio. It's been a place where I've, you know, done painting, I've made masks, I've done performing, I've done workshops, I've had groups of students and, you know, museum trustees and different people come here. Um, so it's, you know, it's had a lot of a lot of use. Just about everything here is, except for the couple of tables, is on wheels, so I can move things around and re this door slash wall is on hinges so it can be moved. So it's got, you know, some flexibility. It's gotten more accumulation, obviously, <laughs> over the years. Uh, I'm going to start talking about the masks because they're kind of prominent when you walk in and maybe a little unusual. They are something that I started making in the 1970s. It was one of those wonderful coincidences that happened, you know, as things do when you're an artist. I helped, I was helping a guy move a refrigerator out of a, an apartment on Hester Street. And I wasn't in this place, I was in the place over on Leonard Street that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and Someone had left a paper mache Japanese style mask. And at that time, I was, I've always been interested in Native Americans. Uh, when I grew up in Southern Ohio, you know, there had been Native American presence there. And it was just sort of a fantasy I had when I was a kid. And at that time, I was also starting to read about shamanism. And in the early 70s, performance art was something that was happening a lot downtown. Actually, there was actually a show opening at the Whitney Museum on Thursday. Um, I can't think of the name of it now, but it's, it's from 1970 to 1980, downtown performance. And I was... When I grew up, my mother taught dance, so I, I studied dance, the Gene Way School of Dance, when I was a kid. And uh, I did it, I stopped for a while, and then I started doing it again in high school, not studying with my mother. That was just too painful, you know? It was like, I was the last boy still tapping, you know? I was just like so embarrassed. But I read something about athletes in college studying dance to help their, their balance and things like that. So I was a football player, so I thought, well, I'll take some ballet classes from this other woman who was teaching for my mother. So I did that. And then again, in college, I did some dancing, and I studied one summer with a woman named Hanya Holm, who was one of the original modern dancers. She was part of the Mary Vigman troupe. Which was, um, so... It was something that was part of my past and, you know, the interest in performance and the mask. So I found this mask. It's sort of a long introduction, but it seemed like it was for me, you know. It was like there was nothing else in this place, a refrigerator and this mask. So I brought it back to my studio and I decided I'd repaint it. I would sort of make it, make it mine. And I painted it and... Uh, and I started putting it on, and I put some music on, and started dancing around, you know. And I just, you know, I started having these ideas, as I said, to do a performance. So I started putting the masks on in my studio, and I was also working with a group of artists. We called ourselves Visiting Artists Collaborative, and uh, 
we were doing workshops and exhibitions. And one of the workshops we did was a mask workshop. One of the other artists is a woman named Theodora Skipateras. She's in the show at the Whitney coming up. So she's a very fantastic artist. If you've ever seen her work, uh, if you go to the Whitney, you can see something she did from the 80s. So we did some workshops. And I decided to develop this performance, because I was in, that's something I wanted to do as a way to introduce this mask workshop. So I put together this thing with layers of masks and costumes. And I had seen when I was growing up on television, there was a kind of clown slash comedian. This is before anybody here, maybe a couple of people. The Ed Sullivan Show, and there was another show called The Seal Test Big Top. There was this guy. I don't know what was really his name, but I call him the, ban the Banana Man. He would come out with this Harpo Marx-like coat on. He never spoke. He hummed maniacally. And he did these sort of transformations. He became all sorts of things. But his main prop was these fake bananas, which he kept pulling out of his coat, you know, and other things. And he, had, he pulled out these collapsible containers which by the end of his act was like a small train. And he filled them all up. And at the end of the act, he got in and he rode away. And I thought that was so cool. I thought, if, I could, if I could ever do something like that, that would be pretty great. So that was one of my models for the, for the performance. Tomorrow, I'm showing a screening a video of sort of a condensation of the performance. I did it over a number of years. And that's sort of where the masks kind of came out. Not, all of these masks here obviously were used for the performance. And I don't think any of these, most of them, those are in a, in a box up there. But the interest in masks kind of grew out of that. And I've worked with a lot of different materials. A lot of these are actually my own face, cast off my face. Uh, things like these take out food containers. I just kind of smash on my face, you know. And, then I've used those to, like this, and you know, cast it with that material. Um, let me just slide back here. I'll, I'll be. I got it. <clears throat> you can see skulls are one. So I've made these things out of aluminum foil that I. I use as a, you know, as a thing for casting. So these are all forms that I've used. And, you know, cleaning out my studio is always a good thing because I find things that I forgot about or kind of get me going. And I had this, I like hats. And I got, when I bought one of my hats, they gave me this plastic form. And... I've made, this is a hat, this is a, like a straw hat, an Asian straw hat. So I've done some other, in the past, hat masks, but I've decided I'm going to, so I just cast this form. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this, but I thought, you know, it's something that I just, just started with. So the masks are sort of an ongoing thing, you know, they come and they go in terms of, how involved I am with them, but it's, you know, it's been an ongoing interest for a lot of years now. And, you know, there's found objects. This is, and that, these galvanized metal things are things they collect maple syrup with in, in Vermont. They're sap bucket covers. Um, so they're, you know, they come from, that's a, Saab hubcap that I found on the road. The white thing, something I ran over with a lawnmower. Uh, so they, you know, there's a variety of, of possibilities with, with the masks. And interestingly, a few years ago, well, actually quite a few years ago, I'm going to talk about the paintings a little bit now. Um, you know, I've been teaching at FIT for a long time, and before the, it's now called VPED, the Visual Presentation Exhibition Design, 
uh, was called the display department. And one of the professors in the display department gave me this little mask. And, you know, he get, I just, thank you. You know, he knew I made masks, and I sort of put it away. And I've had, I don't know how many years I've had this thing, probably 20. And a few years ago, I was thinking, I don't know, I thought about this mask, and I thought, you know, I want to do something with it. And f I've been using Xerox machine as a camera for this, this is called the dance. And the dance is a, a theme that I've used in my work. So, the, you know, using like a color Xerox machine and moving it so it's out of register, but it captures the motion. So these are things I did in 1976. Just to show you sort of how it goes back. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it on a Xerox machine and see what, see what happens. So, you know, I got these images. And that's where these paintings come from. this, you know, and then I make drawings and collages. Let's see, I'm going to come around here, I'll show you one. It's in the drawer here. Like this one, it's sort of the extended version. So they started out as more as a single head, and then I did couples. There's couples there. And then I started flipping them and combining them and making these long, more anthropomorphic kind of beings. And that was really the first time the, the masks and the heads, which is another subject I've been working with for a long time. Um, let me just get a slide behind you here. This piece is a, uh, it's Kurt Schwitters, the Dada, German Dada artist. I took, there was a catalog from, uh, I think it was the Marlborough Gallery of his work. And there were these four photographs of him, which I, you know, cut up and, and recombined. This was done in 1973. And it sort of became the basis for how I approach what I call composite heads. Often they're one person, sometimes they're they're more than one person. So I, you know, find images of people that I'm particularly interested in, figures from art history or popular culture, and I sort of accumulate images of them. These pieces are, it's called the Monk Satie Mix. It's Thelonious Monk, great jazz composer, musician, and Eric Satie, who was a French avant-garde composer in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, they're both, you know, genius artists and both kind of eccentric individuals. So, you know, I found these pictures of, it's not a very big one, but um, here's Monk. And Eric Satie is an older gentleman. Let's find another. Here's a nice one of him as a young, young guy. This is a cool one. So, let's see. So these are the, you know, I sort of accumulate these things. A lot of them I shot off. There's a film 
of Monk called Straight No Chaser. And I shot a lot of pictures of him off the TV. So then I make, I make collages. I made about, I don't know, 150 of these. And I just, you know, kind of keep doing them and accumulate them. And then, then I made some smaller drawings like these, oil pastels. So what happened was, I'm sort of jumping around a little bit, but that's all right. You know, these paintings I was working on for, I don't know, six or seven years over a period of time. And the ones that are up are kind of the last ones that I've done, and it's been a couple of years ago. And I reached a point with them where I wasn't sure, do I want to keep doing these? I'm not really sure. You know, I felt like I needed a rest. And coincidentally, again, one of those great things, my daughter found at a flea market these monster playing cards. This is from a game like an old maid game. She knows my taste, you know, and uh, this is a great story. Let me just, she's 31 now, but um, when she was in probably the fifth grade, she made this in school, and the, they called us in for a conference. <laughs> you know, they thought she was deeply disturbed somehow, but no, she was just, she knew her dad's taste, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, Jasmine brought me, there's a couple more, there's Dracula and Frankenstein over there. So she brought these home, and, uh, you know, these are perfect. So I started doing these monster mashups. Dr. Tom. Do you have a whole set of these? Or just those? Uh, she had a few more. I had maybe 10 or so, and I just, you know, I photocopied them and collaged them together. Venkula. So again, I start with that, and then I've made some, just some other drawings from those, like these. Like this. And then I sort of moved to a larger size. So the work that's up here is the most, these are the most recent things that I've been doing for the last year or so. Just I've been working on paper primarily. Not sure, but again, the, the whole kind of monster, not just monster, but kind of the fantastic and the heads when you have these composite heads, they sort of move beyond, you know, something simply depicting. They become more psychological. And there's a, a woodcut there, Jekyll Hyde, and that's based on some images that I did in the 1980s. So it, you know, it's this kind of theme that runs, runs through my work. Um, these are all Thelonious Monk and Eric Satie. And the other ones are the monsters. Okay. So the ones that have the names on them are the monster mashups. Okay. And the ones here are the monk settee mix. Collage has been a, an important way of, of, organ, of composing things for me for a long time. I, you know, when I started making art, I, I was very interested in collage, sort of the Dada surrealist collage, and, and abstract painting. And you know, I couldn't figure out a way to combine them for a, for a long time. And I, for, so I, I did collages when I was in graduate school, and I painted abstractly. And then I stopped doing collage because I thought only abstract painting was serious art. When I, my work changed from being primarily abstract 
you know, and I had people that was in, that were interested in my work. Then I was showing that work, and it was being collected, and I was in the Whitney Annual and things like that. But I, I or by any like it was different then. But um, you know, I felt I needed to change my work, and I started doing this very kind of introspective and. Uh, I was working with a lot of questions, personal questions, and like right down to what day is it? You know, what day is it? What time is it? How do you know where you are? Stuff like that. And I would do drawings and writing, and and my drawing was pretty bad, in a good sense, because I wasn't. My students know I didn't. I started art really in graduate school. I didn't. I did in college. I did an. I did a. What do they call it? Uh, when you take a class for not for credit. Audit. Audit. I was auditing. Yeah, I was auditing it. And um, so I didn't really. You know, it wasn't until I sort of hit the wall with writing my master's thesis in art history that I realized I really don't want to do this. I want to try to be a painter. You know. And uh, so I didn't have the background that all my students have in terms of drawing. And, and I, I did get a graduate degree, but I basically had one drawing class. You know, they, I took, in order to let me into the program, they were impressed by my academic credentials. But you know, my portfolio was pretty, pretty piddly. You know? And uh, so I took one semester of freshman studio classes. So I took one drawing class and one beginning painting class and a printmaking class and sculpture, I guess, or something like that. And then I started graduate school. So everything else was kind of, you know, more do your own thing. And uh, even the drawing class wasn't as nearly as rigorous as what we have at FIT. So I'm kind of a lot self-taught. and. That was what I was dealing with at that in a lot of the, that work. I was trying to do things that I wasn't comfortable with, but that was part of what I was making myself do. And uh, so people who had been interested in my work came to my studio and they, they couldn't get out of there fast enough. You know, it's it just like, oh my God, what's he doing? So um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I've shown some of this work, not not any of these. I guess that painting over there was shown, but and some of these were shown in Korea, um, the skinny ones. But mostly, for the last couple of years, I've just been kind of working. And now, I mean, this is a good opportunity. It's kind of getting me. You know, I've got a lot of people here, so <laughs> it's time to time to do something. So I'm going to try to you know get some people. To look, I don't know. I don't know. It's, I think it's kind of odd stuff, probably. But what I was going to, also going to say is, I, you know, I decided that whatever I felt like I needed to do, I would do, whether it was, you know, kind of cohesive in a, in a way. And I think, you know, over if you look at my work over a period of time, there's a kind of cohesiveness to it, but. You know, within a year or two, it might jump around a bit. I mean, yes, going from this to that is kind of, kind of, a, but these relate to things that I did, you know, like ten years ago, and that's what happened. Like the set monk sati was something I was going to do before I started these, and once I did the. The monster mashups. I thought, well, I should revisit because I never really did those pieces. I, you know, it's what I was planning to do, and I, you know, I took this down to the Photoshop coffee shop, and you know, this, as it turned out, this piece of yellow parachute fabric had a. There's a grid in the, you know, in the print. So when I put it, and I put that around it just because I wanted to block the light so it wouldn't, you know, like wash out the image. So it was just all kind of coincidence. But 
you know, when the first one came out, this is not necessarily the first one, but when it came out, I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. Because there's, you know, the grid in the mask and the grid in the drapery, but none of it is really a grid anymore. It's all this kind of, you know, the grid, which is something which is very stable and, you know, very kind of rigid in a way is completely destabilized. And this image, you know, has the head and a kind of mask-like quality. So it just seemed, you know, I made, <laughs> I made a lot, of, I did a lot of them. And then they kind of developed into paintings. And yes? Can you maybe talk a little bit about the color? Color, yeah. Color is something that is really crucial to me. It's, um, I think it's one of my, one of my strengths. And I tend to work with high contrast, you know, comp near complementary mixes, um, sat very saturated color. And again, in the, in the grid head paintings, I did, you know, I did drapery, which I never thought I'd do. Um, you know, creating a kind of illusion of these things billowing and folding in space. But, uh, you know, that's what I needed to do, so I figured out a way to do it. And I did a lot of glazing in these paintings with a lot of thin, thin layers of, of color to, to, build the, to build the color and to get the kind of sense of, of the space. All of them are, you know, kind of blown up from these small, small pieces. So what I would do is, you know, pick the collage or image that I wanted to use, and then I would make a big drawing. And students who are in my class now talk to you about the Chief with Cherries thing. That was something that kind of grew out of that. It was this piece that I made that I gave to a lot of people and got it back and it sort of became this expanding thing and really helped move my work in a way that I never expected it because, um, as I said, I had this idea that I was an abstract painter and, and but it, I realized that there was some things in my personality that I wasn't able to deal with adequately with the paintings that I was doing. So I kind of, uh, these are all a little dated, I'm afraid, but I, I haven't, uh, you know, I sort of stopped doing these at a certain point. I did them, I started doing them in the 70s where I, first I found these old newspapers in this place when I, you know, there was a lot of debris here and there was newspapers from the Second World War, actually. And I made some uh, prints with those and I just kept doing them once, you know, while as I, you know, I still have, you know, like headlines over here, you know, things from the newspaper. When something happens, I sort of saved it. But I, I stopped doing that. I don't know. I, maybe I'll pick it up again. But at a certain point, I just kind of ran. I guess after Bush, after the Bush, after Bush won the. Uh, Bush and Gore, I think that was sort of the last time I, I made anything with, with, uh, with the newspaper. But it's been, you know, it was, it's sort of a similar thing because the, in order to get this image of Bush Sr., you know, I had to play around with it. I moved it a little bit and, uh, you know. So what else? I'd be happy to answer questions. You know, I think in terms of my, you know, the way I work in the studio, I've talked about my, you know, kind of my process in terms of developing imagery, um, the masks. It really happens now as the, you know, like with this hat mask. I haven't, I think the last one that I finished recently is the one with the the paint brushes coming out of the head and that took a while i mean those paint brushes sort of accumulated in a 
in a jar for many years. I have other ones. This is when I was doing these paintings that involved a lot of very gloppy paint, and it just kept building up on the brushes like stalactites or stalagmites or whatever they are. And, you know, I saved them for some perverse reason, and I <laughs> then I decided I would impale them in the head. Um, the pig, pygmy mask. I have a collection of noses, different animal noses that I uh, use from time to time. So, you know, they kind of happen as they happen now. There was, there have been, you know, there have been times when I really, you know, making a lot of masks and, you know, they kind of evolve and then, then not. But it's just, you know, it's just an aspect of my work that has uh, sort of been going on for quite a long time now. Uh, these are copper foil. You know, again, they're made on my, on my face. Tina. This is a, the body of a violin. Uh, there used to be a flea market on Canal Street. And I found it was just the, just the front of the vial. Didn't have anything else. So it was just a nice shape. So they. Uh, there it is. So I'm curious to see. Yeah. Uh, do you, and do you exhibit your mask? Yeah. yeah. I've had various shows. Uh, the last one I had was at Fishback Gallery. It was about five years ago. And sometimes when, you know, when I show paintings, sometimes I show masks with them. So it's, you know, combines. Would you say most of them are made to be displayed on a wall? Or are, how many are most, of them, most of them could be worn. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, they're partially meant to be presented but if any the bigger ones with like the big horns and stuff those are more being put on the wall or yeah yeah like the red and green one there yeah um, so it's a form you know it, it it started as something that I wanted to make to wear and then it sort of grew into something that I just sort of dealt with as a form like you know it's a kind of sculpture for me and uh, they you know like all these you know are they're really just, you know, they, I mean, I, I could pad this out with some foam, which I have done, and it could be worn, and then I'd sew some elastic on the back. So if someone wanted to use this, there was a period where um, at the Bowery Poetry Club on Monday nights they had open, you know, like a poetry slam, and Bob Holman, who started the Bowery Poetry Club, a friend of mine, and he, he asked me to bring my masks over so that they would use them during the poetry slam. So, you know, some of the poets didn't like it, but some of them were into it. So it was kind of a mixed bag, but it was, it was fun, you know. And I, I kind of modified some of the, a lot of them so they could be, they could be worn. And, yeah. And so that's, you know, most of them could easily be worn. Like this would be, you know, take some work. Or the, the Ganesh one is, you know, kind of takes more. But it's they're all possible. It's just, you know, as I said, it's it's more a matter of uh, now of seeing. I, I guess as as wall pieces and they hold up on their own, but. Certainly, as a, as a kind of installation, it's it's one of those moments where you walk in the door and you go, what the hell? <laughs> Why is the funniest monk and Eric? Well, as I said, uh, there are two artists who, two musicians, artists, musicians, who are sort of special to me. They're both, I think, genius musicians. They're both kind of were very ex kind of eccentric in their own in their own way, and as I started looking at the pictures of them, there was a remarkable 
kind of coincidence of the way they presented themselves at different times in their life.